welcome to the 17th episode of the 6th season of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 19th of June and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan and with me this week is Tony. Hi Alan. How are you? I'm good, yeah. You survived your boat trip. Yes, I survived. I didn't fall in. Good. Other people did. Um, uh, <laughs> and Laura. No Daves. Hello, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Seamless. How are you? Good, thank you. Super, super. And uh, Mark. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. You've caught the sun. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was really hard. I was chasing it for miles. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy gold. Let's get on with the show. Time for some news. Um, on change.org, there's a petition to create a native Linux Google Drive application. <sighs> What's wrong with using it through the browser? That's uh, what I wondered. What does what does the native what does a native application do? Is there one on Windows? Isn't it like Dropbox? It's, oh. it's like accessing your Google Drive, like all your stuff that's in the cloud oh, that you have um, your Google documents and all your stuff. Right. Using a, a native client, of which there is one for Windows, okay. um, and ever since. Google Drive was announced. People have moaned and moaned and moaned that there isn't a Linux version. And there's been various comments from people saying, well, we'll get to it, you know, it'll it'll come and it'll be, you know, we'll release it when it's ready and all that. And um, it hasn't come yet. And Drive has been around for some time now. It's like 9,000 people have signed this petition. And when 10,000 people have signed it, Nothing will happen. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it works. Yes, the clock will tick over to 10,000 people, everyone will shout hooray, and then nothing nothing at all will result. D- don't the White House have to make a statement or something? Yes, actually that's true, yes. <laughs> Barack Obama will demand that a small niche operating system gets a client from Google, yes. Well, he could be doing worse things. Well, yes. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> Denise Dumas has given an interview about the roadmap for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Ooh. And, and uh, this is RHEL 7. RHEL 7, the, the, um, I think the upcoming release. which is That's the one that comes after 6, isn't it? Yes. Which is the current release. Yes. Yeah. So that's going to have sort of um, uh, an enterprise level support around the stuff we've seen going into Fedora over the past few releases. Oh, so all the um, stuff like System D and... I guess uh, so. Uh, Gnome Shell and all that oh, kind of stuff. Oh, no, not Gnome go. Shell. Upstart. <laughs> Mia. Oh, <yes>. They're, <laughs> they're going to have um, Classic Mode um, as the default, which is oh. it is um, supposed to be familiar to Gnome 2 users, basically. Yes. Um, so, so the idea is that people who have been using Gnome 2 on older versions of Red Hat will upgrade and they'll get Classic Mode, which is a bit like Gnome 2, but actually Gnome 3 without Gnome Shell. Right. They've gone for the don't scare the horses option. And then right. they can progress to modern mode if they want to. <laughs> it's a bit classic so people they're... feel old-fashioned. So the customers that pay for it get what they want, and everyone else who uses the community distro gets Gnome Shell. Is that right? Well, I think I think classic mode is in Fedora. I don't think it's default. Yeah, it is. It's not the default. No. So you can turn it on if you want. You do get what you want in the community one. You just don't, no one does it for you. <laughs> it's probably the right decision. I don't think that people who use Red Hat want modern stuff. <laughs> what? Really? <laughs> no. Why? Yeah. Surely people who want who use Red Hat want corporate support for yes. their desktop. Because yes. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a GUI here, we're talking about corporate workstations. So people yeah. are using corporate workstations and have Red Hat as, their, yeah. as their, their desktop OS of choice. Don't want the latest crack. Well, they, I mean, they still get all the, all the GNOME 3, um, GTK 3 apps to. and stuff. Oh, well, okay. of course. It's just GNOME Shell. I'm sure, uh, you know, they can, I nearly said app to get installed then. Yum they can, or yum up to date it, yes. or whatever it is, Red Hat Network, install GNOME Shell if they want to. In the same way that, you know, when we installed Unity 3D, people could install Unity 2D or, yeah. you know, it's no different really, is it? I'm sure. It's exactly the same. Uh, and I notice they're going to use um, XFS as the default file system. Yes. And okay. Not, not EXT4 or not ButterFS. 
or anything like that. Are there any particular advantages to XFS? Um, well, it's tried and tested. You know, it's been around for a long time and yeah. you know, it works, it's robust. And So they're switching from EXT3, are they, presumably? I don't know what RHEL 6 has, but I would imagine something like that, yeah. Oh, okay, interesting. This, that's and for clean but, installs. ButterFS is going to be supported, but it's not going to be the default option. Oh, good. So oh, it's, good. it's there, it's in, it's in the distro, it's just that if you're doing an install, it will set it to XFS. Right. Mm, cool. Okay, fair enough. Interesting. In other news, a film production company called Good Morning to You Productions has filed a class action lawsuit against Warner Chapel Music over the rights to the song Happy Birthday to You. So Nobody sing it. No. Nobody sing it. So the, re- the reason they're called Good Morning to You Productions is because the, the song which the melody um, of Happy Birthday to You was taken from was originally a song to be sung in schools, which was Good Morning to You, which was supposed to be sung like at the beginning of the day. So was this com- in the 19th century. Was this film company yeah. the production company actually created specifically for the well, purposes apparently they're of taking making, they, were, they were making a film about the um about the song happy birthday and i guess they called themselves after that because that's where the, the history of it mm, right. but perhaps they came across some uh, some copyright bumps in the road when warner said actually we own the rights to that song pay us lots of money um but, but there is a fairly reasonable sounding argument that actually they don't yes it's just that most of the people who get have to pay up are small yeah. organizations and it's not worth their while going to court mm. about it it does make you wonder how many of these um large companies who just uh send out cease and desists or you know demands mm. for uh, yeah. money with menace are you know are actually riding on you know thin ice yeah so the idea here is basically the the melody is from a different song which warner don't own and Apparently they don't own the lyrics either, but they do own a they do own an early recording of it, and they use that to say that they still own it, even though the copyright on it was never renewed when it should have been. Yeah, that's so the effectively, thing. it's now public domain under the public domain laws in America. So when I was in the states um, about ten, twelve years ago, first time, yeah. one of the first times I went over there, um, I was out with some geeks in Palo Alto, and we went to someone's birthday, and. Um, I was about to sing Happy Birthday to You. And all the geeks kind of pounced on me and were like, oh, no, 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 don't sing that. Even though it's like private residence and it's not, you know, it's not a broadcast or anything. But they were, they they actively, you know, go around telling people not to sing it as as a way of promoting the fact that Warner have copyright on it. Not because they don't want to get done, but yeah. they want people to know that Warner are misusing this, this right. alleged yeah. copyright. So, yeah, hopefully this case will prove that they don't have copyright over it. So every time they play Marilyn Monroe pl- singing it, does somebody have to pay for it? I guess. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Nero is listening live in the IRC channel, and he says that they have the copyright on the arrangement. Uh, so um, that would explain some of their copyright. But yes, it's one of those things well, where copyright yeah. has been extended and extended exactly. over the years. The Mickey Mouse syndrome, where every 20 years copyright gets extended by another 20 years, so that Mickey and his friends never go out of copyright and Disney can keep on making money out of them. Mm. Except in this case, 50 years ago, they failed to do that. Mm. Mm. There we go. Apparently. Uh, fascinating, though, that is, this is my favourite story of the week, as those of you who know me will understand. Uh, <laughs> A company called Leadworks, the 3D game engine and visual editor, has launched a Kickstarter campaign to bring its software to Linux. Is it it software to do with photography and weddings? (laughs) Um, No, it's something to do with games. Um, (laughs) You do sound like an old man when you say games. (laughs) So at this point, I'm going to defer my better judgment to my friends Alan and Mark. Hello. Um, Although I will just say that basically they're trying to make an IDE available to, to develop games on Linux, not just play them on Linux. You yes. sound about as comfortable with IDE as you did with games. <laughs> <laughs> they have some software. What software? Um, uh, I Actually, I, someone asked me that in Spain a couple of weeks ago. What is software? I was, no, don't go down that road. Um, uh, so, yes, they have a, a development tool which uh, developers use to write games. And it has a, a an editor and a modeling tool for creating the 3D models that go in your game. And uh, it supports a couple of languages. Lua, which is very popular in, in gaming for scripting right. um, and stuff, and C++. And at the moment, 
they do all that on Windows and I think OS ten as well. I think so, yes. And you can make games for mobile as well on it. Right. And and you can export your game out for a number of different platforms. Like, yeah. yeah, mobile devices or Windows or, or OS ten. Cool. Um but they've their Kickstarter campaign is very um it's it's interesting because they're not just saying we want to port our our tool across to Linux, please help pay for the development costs to do that. They're they're pitching it as as this is, you know, in some ways the savior of gaming on Linux. And, you know, if we come to Linux, we'll bring these developers with us and they can then work on Linux and um, uh, export their games to Linux and run natively on the local machine rather than developing on Windows and then copying across to a Linux machine and running it on the Linux machine, if that makes sense. Yeah, which at the moment, if you want to do like a... a big 3d game um, Uni- Uni- does unity 3d unity, unity 3d does the same thing it runs ah, on okay. windows and on the mac yes. and you can spit yes. out a windows exactly. version or a right. linux version but yeah, so yeah. their argument is all that's stopping people from developing games on linux is the lack of a text editor that's <laughs> 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 yes all games are made in text editors tony yeah. that's right where i come from Net text hack. editor is a game yeah <laughs> <laughs> Where I come from, <laughs> multiplayer notepad. So, so they kick, they did this uh, Kickstarter campaign. It only started a couple of days ago, and uh, how much are they asking for? Was it something uh, like 80, 20 thousand $20, dollars. Oh, okay, and I think it's been like forty eight hours or so far, and they're now up to eight and a half thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. So they're doing pretty well, yeah. Um, and and it's quite interesting. The, the whole thing is branded as you know we're bringing it to Linux, bringing the the tools yeah. to Linux, and you know. And they're talking about like expanding the the portfolio and yes. you know, promoting the development of Linux exclusive games as well. Yes, it's it's an interesting uh, pitch. Yeah. Rather than just saying, you know, you can use our tool to create games for Linux. Yeah. Which is what Unity 3D does. Yeah. They're saying you can actually come across to Linux mm. and work on the machine. And the other thing they're doing is um, Steam integration as well. So there's um, a thing on on uh, Steam called the Steam Workshop. Um, and they're planning to integrate legworks with it so that you can take assets for your games. Like someone might have made a model of a car and you want that in your game and they've shared it on Steam Workshop so you'd be able to pull it into legworks and use it in your game. Yeah. Um, and also they have um, a thing called Steam Greenlight where people can submit their games and then the community vote on them and the highest voted ones get sold through Steam, basically. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have it so that legworks is integrated so you can push your game out to Steam for people to vote on. So they've got a number of rewards, you know, T-shirts, the usual, yeah. the usual kind of stuff. But if you pay a hundred dollars, uh, you get. Oh, actually, there's one lower than that, isn't there? There's a fifty dollar one that actually gets you the software. So it's non-free software. Boo. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, it's fifty dollars gets you the indie version, which lets you create games and script in this language called Lua. Right. And a hundred dollars gets you the version that lets you create games using C plus plus and Lua. Right. Okay. So fifty or a hundred gets you the actual software, or any. And there, are, there are people who are who say, "I'm not a game developer, but I've thrown some money your way anyway." Cool. Because I want to see the tool on Linux, yeah. and I want to see more games on Linux, which is right. cool. Interesting. Nathan Schneider has posted on the Huffington Post blog suggesting that a move to Linux may be the answer to freeing ourselves from companies complicit in mass government surveillance. Ooh. What is companies it, would those be then? I don't know, but this is always All the answer, them. isn't it? Yes. When it, some, somebody does something bad in technology, maybe everyone will move to Linux. Yeah. But isn't Google on Linux? Well, they're maybe iffy. You can be on Linux without giving all your data to Google. Yeah. Yes. But give it to Canonical and you can also <laughs> you can also be a company that runs all your in, uh, infrastructure on Linux and give all your stuff to the NSA. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, for those who perhaps haven't seen this in the press over the last couple of weeks, uh, an organisation or a scheme called Prism, run by the US government, has been unveiled, which shows that basically they have taps into Apple and Google and Facebook. And did they bother with Yahoo with that? <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo say not. Um, yeah. And all the companies involved have denied that the NSA have these taps. The NSA seem pretty sure that they have these taps. And you hope you'd they think would NSA well, would not. They, they, to be, they to were be quite fair, angry about it being revealed. Which, it wasn't uh, the NSA was who revealed this. Yeah. It was the Guardian, uh, Edward um, Snowden. Snowden, Snowden, who was a, a sysadmin. Yes, working in Hawaii for yes. Booz Allen. It's quite quite interesting seeing his interview because he talks about how you know a lot of the 
the agents or whatever they're called in the NSA, you know, they'll they'll know what they're working on, but they won't see what other people are working on. So they won't necessarily know the scale. Whereas the sysadmin, because he's administering the whole system, gets to see absolutely everything. If you've got root at the NSA, yeah. you've got yeah. access to a lot of That's stuff. So but do you know the thing that this really made me think is, you know, when I... Um, I've often thought, you know, for the companies that I work for, like, you know, Canonical at the moment, hmm. I trust the um, the sysadmins... And, you know, we have a mail server and the mail goes through that mail server yeah. and, you know, all my company emails in there. And I think, yeah, I trust those guys. And then I think, look at someone who's um, seen as a bit of a hero and is is seemingly doing things for a good spirited reason. And I think, you know, any one of those guys in the office could be, uh, you know, a well-meaning person and just, like, upload my mailbox to <laughs> an FTP server somewhere or, or give it to The Guardian. I realise my email is nowhere near as I was going to say, it depends as, what you've been doing. <laughs> as, as the NSA, but it did make me, you know, think twice about where I where I store stuff and kind of reevaluate. You should use G-Man instead. Yeah. <laughs> the difficulty is that for people who want to use open source software to get out of home to use these cloud services that we've been talking about for the last five, ten years, um, is that it's still not as easy to set up a, a Google Drive equivalent on your own, um, you know, own hardware and then run it. I do wonder whether companies who actually have a bit more money to throw at these things will will start to move their mm. uh, facilities back in-house, having spent mm. a long time moving them out to the cloud. Yeah, it's time for that cycle. Well, it's not quite time for that cycle. It's almost time for that cycle to come round again. Yeah. Private clouds. Yeah. Yeah, these things do sort of tend to come around every so often anyway, don't they? And that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that pleases, puzzles or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And now it's time for the community news, including events. Snappy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Stephen M. Webb has blogged about upcoming developments in Unity, including allowing Unity to run on the Mir display server with support for X11 applications and greatly expanded number of scopes for searching in the dash. Stephen's awesome. He's got a team of guys who are working on, you know, uh, getting Unity ready for release in uh, 13.10, and they did the same thing for 13.04. Um, So they're working really, really hard to get, you know, that robust and working nicely so the next the the version of unity going to be running in 13.10 is 7.1 is that right and then unity 8 is the the one which is going to be running on Mir. yeah so unity 8 is the one that runs on the phone preview image that you see at the moment um and unity 7 is the one that uh is in 13.04 yeah um and phone um uh, convergence of phone and desktop is aiming to come at 1404. Right. So you've got version 7 in 1304, 7.1 in 1310, and then 8 in 1404. Right. So, and to, to enable that, they need all of the, the old X type applications, which are the ones that you use on desktop at the moment, things like mm. Firefox, OpenOffice, anything Chromium else, and anything yeah. with a window. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, there needs to be a compatibility between that and the uh, display server which the phone uses yeah and i understand there is a, a driver being implemented that will allow a- a- applications that use the old windowing system called mm-hmm. x yes. to run on the new windowing system called mir yes but there needs to be some work done because you then lose things like 3d acceleration because you're using you're not using the 3d accelerator driver anymore oh so you know there's work to be done right but that's coming soon is yes. it? And they've got time for that. Yeah. They've got no, it's interesting. To, it's yeah. interesting to read. It's all. I mean, it's very open and honest about. You know, here's what we've been working on, and here's why it's broken at the moment, sort of thing. Right. Okay. It's quite complicated, but I think the impact for users could be quite big, couldn't it? Yeah, and with um, so the the idea is that in thirteen ten you'll have Unity seven point one, which won't look that different from Unity seven that's in uh, the current stable release yeah polish and bug fixes i think polish and bug fixes plus all the new scopes 
that mm-hmm. didn't that were backed out at the last minute for thirteen oh four um, are being um, so you can search eBay as well as Amazon. And lots of other things as well. Oh. Uh, and this hundred scopes thing, which is not a hundred, but it's you know, it's some big number of scopes that are going into thirteen ten. All of that stuff. Um, plus, there'll be a login that you can uh, use to test out the new Mir stuff mm-hmm. and the new you know, Unity eight style, um, and then it'll be default in fourteen oh four. So each scope is a place you can search, whether it's applications or files think, or Amazon. Well, I think of it as like a data source. Yeah, a scope okay. is a data source. Right. So, uh, for example, Amazon is one. Yeah. yeah. eBay could be one. Yeah. yeah. Um, your hard disk is one. Flickr and Flickr. You know, Spotify okay. or yeah, any anything where there's basically anywhere where there's content that you might want to access. Anywhere where there's a referral thing that <laughs> the canonical can know. Yes, pay my, pay my wages, please. <laughs> one of the issues with the Amazon one when it first announced was that it wasn't encrypted and it was uh, people were curious about the anonymization. Mm-hmm. Um, is that the same for all these other ones? Do they all go through Canonical servers and get uh, pushed out through them? They all still go through Canonical servers, yeah. And are encrypted? Uh, as far as I understand it, yeah. I haven't looked at the new 100 scopes stuff. But okay. presumably they're open source, so if you're worried, Tony... Yeah, you can them. use your coding skills to uh, to delve into it and find out. You do okay, have a text editor, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> You're just being rude now. <laughs> Moving on. Jonathan Riddell has started a discussion on Ubuntu Devil mailing list about how non-Unity flavors, such as Kubuntu, will handle the move to Mir. Mm. So this so, is related to that previous yes. So there's, there. there's a worry, basically, that because Mir is designed for Unity, that getting things like KDE or... XFC to run on it, which are designed to run on X, hmm. isn't going to happen. So they'll need to um, do something like move to Wayland and rely on the upstream Debian packages, which probably aren't going to be looked at very much by Canonical and hope that they continue working with everything else that's in the Ubuntu repositories. It's a lengthy discussion and it's, I mean, it's still going on now. I pasted that link when it started a few days ago and it's still going on now and there's yeah, you know, there's a bit of heated debate about um, uh, pe- with people having different perception of of what needs to be done and who's responsible for doing the mm. various bits and whether it will get done and whether it will continue to be maintained. And um, Jono has been wading in um, to the thread to try and um, mediate and get people talking to each other so they can kind of have a conversation about it and figure out a plan and a way forward. And there's been some canonical people saying that they'll commit developer time to, you know, sort these problems out. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a sticky situation for some of the um, um, the uh, flavours. Yes. It's a bit like bridged on tyres and Ferrari many years ago. <laughs> yes, yes, it's exactly like yeah. that. Um, I think of all of the different flavours of, of Ubuntu, so the Lubuntu, Zubuntu, Ubuntu Studio, Mythbuntu, Kubuntu. Edubuntu. Edubuntu. They're like the Jordan teams. Right. Um, okay. The, <laughs> Where can my analogy? All of those use, use environments that ca- that can't currently work with Mir. Uh, no, well, Mir isn't finished yet. Yeah. So uh, I think I think there's been there's been some uh, assumption that that it won't work and it can't work, and there's also been some uh, discussion around the fact that well, we've already decided the upstreams have already decided mostly KDE and GNOME have already decided that they're going to go with Wayland. So mm. therefore, in inverted commas, the free software community has decided to go with Wayland. So why should we waste our time working on getting mere support as well when we've already got the commitment to go in this direction? Yeah, and so there's a bit of frustration there because people feel that they're going to have to do a like, duplicate amount of work and, yeah. to support multiple uh, display servers. Mm. What's the benefit of mere? Oh crikey. That's not a question I can answer in 30 seconds. It's okay. uh, Sorry, we've got five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, so the timer have... ticks down. <laughs> Alan drums his fingers on the arm of the chair. <laughs> yeah. Going, hmm. We should get someone on to talk about it. Yeah. We should. Yes. Some of you know what we're idea. talking about. Yeah, we could get Thomas on and talk about Mia. Yeah. There's a new advantage to being an Ubuntu member, as if there weren't enough. Um, this one is that you can get a certificate. Signed mm. by what? Mark Shuttleworth. A digital Actual certificate. Printed. And a, a, a printed certificate, <laughs> oh, apparently on good quality paper stock. Oh. Are you going to get one? Hoping, <laughs> Sorry. I was hoping it was going to be an SSL certificate for my website. Oh, 
Oh, no. Oh, I see what you did there. Signed by Mark Shuttleworth. Signed, 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 signed with, with yeah, yeah, signed with Mark Shuttleworth's own personal key. <laughs> uh, yeah, this has got a cool thing. I think is it, it really? Is. Do you think that? I think that's sarcasm. No, isn't it? I can't work out whether it's brilliant, and I want one. Or <laughs> it's a bit. Um, so, so if you're already an Ubuntu member, yeah. is he going to send them out to everyone, yes. or do you have? Oh, okay. You have to request it. But yes, they uh, they will. Hear have you it. requested yours, Tony? No, not yet. But I might do it during the uh, judging by the grin on your face du- during yeah during the break yeah. between the episodes. Yeah. And what are you going to do with it? Put it on my put wall. it on his wall <laughs> next to a signed picture of Matt Smith. Yeah, <laughs> I think you can say my signed picture of Mark Shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> he so hasn't got one of those. The Ubuntu members team on Launchpad, which I think one way they gauge how many you know, who who's going to be eligible to have one of these um, <laughs> prized possessions. Are you looking be, forward to yours? Showing, then? They'll be showing up on Antiques Roadshow in a hundred years or so. Um, Seven hundred round of ours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 770 odd members. Yeah, John is going to be busy faking the signature on 700 of those. Isn't <laughs> John Mark's going to get a rubber stamp. Oh, no, he's going to. He'll cut it into a potato. Yes. Oh. Yes, totally. Get Ack on it. Actually, at uh, Lug Radio Live, didn't uh, yes. uh, Ack actually potato stamp Mark's, yes. uh, Mark's hand? Mm. Yes. Yes. I, I like the idea that he didn't know who he was, but I'm not sure whether that's true. Right. But the first one know who Mark was. <laughs> the first Lug Radio Live well, in 2005. Mark didn't know who Ack was. How could he <laughs> possibly not know? know? Who as who as fascinating as I'm sure this discussion is for our listeners about people we know, <laughs> what wow. else is in the community news? Laura, Ooh. is there something else? else on Jono's blog? Mm, uh, something about an Ubuntu app developer cookbook featuring commonly asked questions about Ubuntu app development along with their answers and code examples. I actually thought this was going to be like one of those O'Reilly cookbooks. No, is it's it on O'Reilly a website. who do them? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. But no, this is this is a um, like a, a it's just pinched a the frequ- idea. frequently asked questions on Ubuntu app development. This is Jono saying there's going to be some documentation, basically. <gasps> <laughs> oh, for us, for app developers. Yeah, yeah. So there like, isn't yeah, any com- the commonly asked questions, the <laughs> answers enough. to them, and code snippets. Yes, exactly. Which is nice. Yeah, right. How do I read stuff from the camera? Exactly. Here's how. Copy paste. Yes, exactly. Good. That's uh, developer dot ubuntu dot com. Yes. Uh, Ubuntu Touch is now based on Saucy Salamander, although there's still some compatibility and stability work to to be done to bring it up to scratch with the raring based images yes i have in my hand a phone running saucy salamander i understand it doesn't yet work on the nexus 7 uh yes it does oh i have one of those in my bag over there yes it does work it's they're both a little bit glitchy um uh, we've got some cool apps on here this one is my favorite app it's the cow box it's it's a it's an app that plays animal sounds yes yes, it does it's cool Excellent. That, that's what. Do you know what we don't have? We don't have a fart app. You see, that's why this cookbook needs to be made so that people know how to make apps like that, like yeah. soundboards of John O'Bacon. Exactly. They, yes. Oh, I notice it plays sound. It didn't used to do that. Well, get us. Ah. See. Ah. ah there you go, you see. With this sheep noise, we will take over the world. It's it almost like there's some. By the way, sound around. sound doesn't work on the Nexus Seven at the moment. That's well, broken. that's shocking. Yes. There we go. Do we have some events? Uh, we do, yes. Um, there's a Hack and Talk on the 29th of June in London. Oh, this is uh, Laura Tchaikovsky's. Yes. 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 She, yep. she, mentioned, she it mentioned it last couple time. of episodes. Yes, I heard. I was listening. On your <laughs> boat. Yes. Uh, uh, there's also Flossie holding an open street map mapping picnic in Tower Hamlets, Cemetery Park. Do you need a lot of mapping in Cemetery Park? There's a lot of paths to okay. cemeteries. Cool. Yeah, you only need to do it once. That's uh, July the 20th. <laughs> Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. And there's also an open street match, open street map. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. Street map conference? Yeah, that's the one. 6th to the 8th of September this year at Aston University Business School Conference Centre, Golly, in Birmingham. Um, Been there, <laughs> nice place. And uh, yeah, I don't know what that's all about, but it's we'll the, their annual Open Street Map Conference, State of the Map, and it's been held all around the world. Um, and it's coming back to the UK for the first time in about six or seven years. Oh, I think. Cool. So that's quite cool. Excellent. Software Freedom Day is on Saturday, the 21st of September. The registration deadline for teams to get free goodies is the 21st of July. 
So you've got a month for that. Yes. So Ooh. that's softwarefreedomday.org. And what else? There are no other events. Oh, camp. Uh, that oh. Is, except that one. That is an event. Yes, that is happening at uh, LJMU in Liverpool on the 19th and 20th of October. Yes. And we will be telling you more about it in the coming weeks. Indeed. Watch this space. And the website. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing Linda Sandvik from Co Club, reading your feedback and making your life a little bit easier with some question marks. That Come is supposed to say love. it's a it's a gooey love next time actually. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So and I think it's a really good one because I chose it. Good. Excellent. Yes. So um, yeah, thank you very much indeed for listening and join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.